uh, later. But once again, for those who are just logging in, welcome. I can see that uh, more uh, people are logging in right now. Welcome. And uh, my name is Melvin Ma. I'm the chairman of TBN Asia. TBN Asia stands for Transformational Business Network. Asia and we are fighting poverty to enterprise, especially in the region of Southeast Asia. So I know that there are um, a number of social entrepreneurs tuning in. So welcome from the region as well. So today, everything is about food tech. All right. So we concentrate on milk and fish. And uh, I trust that the technology and the innovation that's being shared all right, first by uh, Dr. Ezra Shushani and then by Professor Matthew Tan will really help us start thinking about how we can use tech to help us not just sustain but scale as well. All right, now for the uh, first part of it, we have Dr. Uh, Ezra Shushani. He hails from Israel. In fact, uh, actually, he's five hours behind us, so actually, it's in the morning uh, in Israel. And this is like uh, Shabbat, which is Sabbath. So they're coming to their holiday as well. So thank you, Dr. Ezra, for tuning in. Now, just a brief introduction of Dr. Ezra. He spends more than 10 years in China, okay, as a counselor that uh, connects both Israel and China together for economic cooperation, but focusing a lot on agriculture uh, and food. And then, of course, he's a consultant to dairy companies in China as well. So, you know something? He not only speaks Hebrew, and not only speaks English, but he speaks Chinese as well. All right. Ni hao. Zao wa ni hao. Yeah. So, and, and he is uh, also uh, helping startups in Israel in this area of uh, milk and milk and culture. Uh, at the same time, he is a lecturer in Hebrew University. It's one of the top universities in, uh, in the world, actually, that uh, focuses on agriculture and science. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the time over to uh, Dr. Ezra Shoshani. And uh, he will take us through, in actually a very brief time, probably about 20, 25 minutes, on why is Israel producing uh, the cows that can produce the most milk in the world, despite the fact that their uh, climatic conditions are not the most ideal. All right, over to you, uh, Dr. Ezra. Thank you. Welcome all to Israel. And I'm going to talk about uh, dairy farming in Israel. First, I wanted to show you um, uh, the Israel, uh, this, to recognize Israel to you, Israel is located in the Mediterranean Sea and we are circled by, by Arab countries like Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. Um, the air, surface area of Israel, a small country, 20, uh, 21,500 square kilometers, while, while the work, work, uh, workable land is only 20% of it. Oh, by the, the way, Dr. Ezra, is, uh, yes, sorry please. to in interrupt. Uh... It, you're supposed to have your PowerPoint, right? Yes. Yeah, because the PowerPoint will show the geography. Um, can we have uh, the PowerPoint of Dr. Ezra put up so that uh, as she talks, it can be seen by everyone at the same time? Uh, Dr. Ezra, is it okay for me to show your slides or do you want to do it yourself? No problem. No problem. Okay. So I have to close mine. Yep. Uh, let me know when you want me to go to the next slide. This is my, this is the next slide, you see. So we are at the Israel map. Should I go to the next slide? This one, it is the topography of Israel. And uh, this is the rainfall from the north part to, to, to the south part of Israel. So what, what would you like to do is to, to show my PDF? 
Uh, I am showing your PDF. So I will close this, this presentation and you will show my, my presentation in PDF. All right. Uh, Melvin, can you pop yes. up you can see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Thank you. Should I close my presentation? Yes. Okay. So this is the slide I uh, this is the, the last uh, modified PDF I sent you to you, Melvin. Yes. yes. Okay. So you can see the, the rainfall in Israel is quite versatile all over the country. In the south part of Israel is almost desert, no rain. In the south in the north part of Israel, it's quite a lot of rain. So in the average, we are talking about between 500 to 600 uh, millimeter rains uh, precipitation uh, along the year. So can you change to the next slide because you, <laughs> you control it, not mine. So the seasons are, uh, the rainy winter is between November and April, while the dry summer is between May and October. Next slide, please. The climate in Israel is in summer hot and humid. Uh, in you know it's between thirty to thirty-five degrees, while you know in the uh, in in uh, the desert sometimes is is uh, above 40, 40 degrees uh, Celsius. I think that the most uh, uh, the most uh, difficult uh, weather is uh, actually al along the the coast shore, while we have uh, hot the combination of hot and humid during the summer. Um, I, th I suggest uh, go, go farther. The next slide, please. You can see on this map the distribution of uh, the milk, milk farms all over Israel is from the south to the north, uh, but the, the, the majority is along the, the seashore and coming to the south part of Israel, to uh, Galilee of Israel and uh, to the uh, north part of Israel. So the annual milk uh, consumption per capita in Israel is around 180 uh, liters. This is according to a summary of, 19, of uh, 2019. Annual milk production uh, in Israel is uh, 1.560 million kilogram of uh, milk is actually under quota, and I will explain it later about it. And uh, to uh, produce this amount of milk, we have 120,000 milking cows all over the country. Next slide, please. The start was uh, local, local bre bread. Uh, go to the next one, it was a small cow. You can see, yeah, you can see this uh, small cow. Um, uh, we call it baladi. The body, body weight uh, was around 200 uh, kilograms, not more than that. The milk production was very, very low, but actually this, this uh, cow, I would call it animal, was multifunctional uh, animal because uh, the farmers at that time used this cow for, pl for, for fluff, for thre uh, threshing, transportation, and so on and so on. The increasing demand for fresh milk during all seasons was a result of growing population, especially in urban areas. And this brings us to the next slide, which shows, please go to the next slide, that uh, shows that bringing us to, uh, brought us uh, to, uh, um, to fulfill the, the requirements to increase the, the production and to produce fresh milk uh, during all seasons, including uh, summer. And the third was very important under our condition, tolerance for heat stress and disease resistance. So in 1925, we started to import Frisian bulls from the Netherlands and Germany, and later uh, import Austin bulls, including cows from uh, US and also Canada. And in 1955, the, there was the first local SAR evaluations for milk production. So we actually produce the pure Israeli Friesian Holstein uh, breed in Israel. And this brought us to establish uh, AI, artificial insemination companies. 
Next slide, please. So you can see the first uh, on the left side, this is Balad Baladi, very small, uh, very small. We also use the uh, crossbreeding with the Mascus, uh, cross local with Dutch and uh, so on and so on. And uh, we are coming uh, later to the local Israeli Olsten. You can see on the right uh, corner. Let's go to the next, please. Next slide. Uh, let me see here. Yes, uh, you can see here, I put here, there, there are many, many figures here. Just I don't, just put, put uh, uh, only the, the importance in 1931, we had uh, very few cows in the herd book, around 3,000. The milk was around uh, 4,000 liters. And this is fed, uh, this is the fed uh, percentage. If we go to 1999, uh, you can see we increased the number of cows in the herd to almost 100,000 uh, milking cows. The milk production increased to 10,500. And uh, the fed uh, percentage was at that time low, 3.26, because the breeding target was to, uh, to produce uh, mostly the milk, the liquid. So later we, can, we, paid, we paid attention to also the content of the milk. If we go down to, this, to the slide, I'm sorry, I cannot see it here, but if you go to the slide down here, I'm, I cannot see the, the, the numbers here. Could you read it? I'm uh, sorry. 3.77% fat and the milk kg per cow is 12,000. And the number of cows in the herd is 118,000. Okay, so you, you can see we, uh, during the, those years, we increased the milk production, but also we succeeded to increase the content of the milk in terms of uh, fat content and protein content. Please go to the next slide. Uh, and this is the, uh, in 1918, you can see the milk production was around 12 thousands compared to 12, 2017, forget about uh, 2017. So we can, we can see we are, the Israeli uh, cow is uh, the highest milk production all over the world. Uh, and actually today we are coming to 12,500 12, uh, kilogram. And the number of cows appearing here uh, in this, this line here, 118,000 cows. We cannot, we cannot uh, raise more cows because we are under quota in Israel. And you can see the, num the average cow per herd is around 230 cows. But there is a difference between two, two men movement, the cooperative kibbutz, we have the average around 500 uh, milking cows, while in the family farms, today we have around, about, about 120 uh, 20 cows. Go to the next slide. Now, to show you that uh, we are climbing up all the time, the 20 highest average annual production in 2012 was 13,000 to 4, 14,000 kilogram. And in 2019, it was not far from this, but 13,100 to 14,785, close to 15,000 kilogram. And today it's, it's not uh, rare to find uh, Israeli cows that producing around 18,000 kilogram per year. Next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Ezra, Dr. Ezra. Can I interrupt for a little while? Yes. You, you mentioned... You, on your account. Yeah, you mentioned under quota. What do you mean by under quota? Okay. Uh, uh, I, I will explain it later because uh, we ah. will uh, come to the to this description of uh, uh, how we, how we um, control the milk production in Israel. And you will receive sure. the answer okay. later. Okay. okay. Uh, so you can see the tendency along the years that we increasing the milk production and uh, also the fat and protein uh, um, content in the milk. Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. Right. Uh, no, 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 no. No, you go, please, one, one, one before, yes. What can you see here is uh, the trend that uh, occurs all over the world. The number of farms along the years is decreasing, while the milk, the, uh, the average production per farm is increasing. This is, uh, this is occurring also in, uh, in developed countries in, uh, in Europe. It occurs also in the United States and also in, in Israel, unfortunately. Yeah, next slide, please. Um, so I think I suggest to, to, to go further one more. We are actually st very stable in milk production along the, 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 the last few years, but uh, we are uh, still on the top of, of the world in milk production. So I, we spoke about the cooperative uh, farm kibbutz. We have in Israel 162 kibbutz that have uh, uh, dairy farms. And the average yield per cow is about 12,300 kilograms. And the fat content is 3.75%, the protein 3.33%. This is also very high among the, the, the countries that have the Olsen milking cows. We have the highest uh, fat uh, uh, content in the milk because of the genet genetic modification in Israel. In the family farms, we have 355 farms. Just for, for an example, if we, if we were, go 10 years ago, the number of family farms was around 800. So you can see the dramatic decrease in, in uh, decrease in number of farms in the family farms. And the milk production is a little bit uh, lower than in the, in the cooperative farm because the, there are still farms that are milking the cows only twice a day and not three times a day. In, in the kibbutz farm or cooperative farms, the, the uh, frequency of milking is around, is uh, all, in all farms, is three times a day. In, in uh, Moshav, between two to three times a day. Let's go to the next slide, please. So in Israel, we have uh, at, at the moment 120,000 cows uh, in herd book. All cows are Israeli Olsten, 90-30% of cows with recorded production, and we'll talk about it later. All the cows, 100%, are under artificial insemination, and only mechanical milking is implied all over the country. Um, so in the cooperative farm, the size, we, show, we saw these numbers before, so we will move, uh, move, uh, move uh, up, yes. Uh, there are limiting factors actually of uh, producing milk in Israel. First, we are suffering from water so shortage. <clears throat> we have limited land. I showed you before, we have only 20% of uh, uh, arable land for, for agriculture. And there is a con uh, constant uh, pressure coming from urbanization. And the last uh, 10 years, there are uh, more and more uh, ecological uh, uh, regulations that uh, make mixed uh, force forces on on the, on the dairy farms uh, to adopt the farms to uh, to the new regulations. This is good because Israel uh, ten years ago subsidized uh, the changes in the farms. I was part of it. Uh, in order to cope with the new regulations. And it, it brought the old farms in Israel to upgrade the, the, the farms, the, the, the barns, the milking uh, system, uh, the treatment of the manure, and so on to the up, up uh, uh, necessary regulations. Go to the next slide, the next slide please. Uh, now, this is very important. The milk production in Israel is organized, controlled and organized by agreements between 
dairy farmers, dairy industry, and government. National production quota, Melvin, you can see now, national production quota is fixed and divided into farmer quotas nice. every year, okay? And also, this, uh, I will speak about it in a minute, Israel Marketing Board is also responsible for quota distribution among the funds, but also we have enforced gold standard milk price uh, all over the country uh, with, um, with uh, uh, with corrections, if the, if the farm produced more, more fat and protein, they, they will receive extra money for, for, for the milk. Let's go on. So in Israel, at the moment, we don't have whatsoever no subsidize on milk production. This is a contrast to what happened in Europe, for instance. There is large influence of climatic conditions, mainly during the, the summer. There is water cost because we are suffering from a water shortage. The cost of the water is very high. Uh, the most uh, forages used in Israel is from wheat and silage. 80% is wheat and uh, the rest is uh, corn. All grains that uh, is used are used for uh, dairy consumption are imported from uh, the global market. Next slide, please. So, in, in total, uh, to produce milk, we need it uh, requires high costs of, uh, of of the feeding in order to fulfill also sorry to fulfill environmental regulation. Um, there are pressure on the farm on the farms constant uh, calculation of the alternative value of the land and uh, fa farmers' socio-economic uh, characteristics. They are, uh, we are suffering from uh, uh, la labor scarce and uh, the price for labor is very high. Let's go on, please. Next slide, please. You can see that, that along the year, we can see the, the fluctuations of uh, uh, milk production while in, during the summer between July and, and, and end of October, you can see decrease of milk production. Please go on to the next slide. I suggest to, to move on. This is uh, just an explanation on uh, the criteria of uh, milk quality in Israel, which is very, 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 very uh, strict and actually um, Besides, besides the milk, the highest milk production in Israel, the milk quality in, is, in Israel is among the best in the world. Yeah, so we are talking about bacteria count and uh, somatic cell count. Uh, I'm not going through because it uh, requires a lot of uh, time to speak about it. But this is the main, main uh, characters of milk quality. And also milk is uh, checked every delivery to the, to the dairy plant to residue of antibiotics and other residues and so on. So the milk quality that Israel, uh, Israeli uh, citizens uh, consume is with very, very high uh, quali quality. Um, well, this is the uh, details about uh, fertility. Uh, I'm not going through much. Let's go on. Let's go on. Um, now, this is very important. What are the factors that are affecting the, the production level? Uh, so we uh, we actually using the proper management of each stage of, of cow, cow life. The calves and heifers um, raising, dry period and the transition period. It's almost scientific fashion, really, to adopt uh, the, the appropriate ration for each uh, branch of, uh, of uh, uh, animals. Um, so we use a very uh, Israeli uh, developed software to uh, um, 
to, uh, to uh, plan appropriate uh, or nutritional plans for all cows. Uh, we have genetic improvement by defined goals, which are changing every uh, you know, year to year uh, by Israel Cattle Breeders Association. We will talk in a minute about it. Uh, very important in Israel in order to uh, produce uh, milk with the same level in summer as in winter, we must uh, relieve the heat stress during, uh, during summer. I will show you in a minute a few, uh, few uh, pictures. And also we developed a very special housing for high yielding cows in Israel, which is quite different from other countries. I'll show you pictures in a minute. And uh, the last is data record, no, sorry, data recording, which is very important to, to be integrated in the genetic uh, improvement system. Please go on. Next slide, please. During summer, dry matter intake, milk yield, and conception rate might decrease if we will not take actions to relieve the heat stress. So intensive efforts are oh. made. Sorry? Yeah. If that's okay, can I continue? Intensive uh, efforts are made yeah, to, okay. to leave the heat stress during the summer, mainly through the use of showers combined with ventilation. Mm -hmm. Let me show you pictures. Go ahead. Next slide. You can see in a, in a, a picture, which is typical to see in every farm in Israel, cows are brought to a, a cooling yard several times a day, between five to eight times, depends on, on uh, the month of, uh, of the year. During the August, for instance, all cows in Israel are cooled about six to eight times a day. This is very, very important. Next, please. And we use, uh, we, we use a, a special uh, sensors to measure the body temperature of the cows in order to adopt appropriate uh, uh, procedures to cool the cows. That's a picture. I, I put, it, uh, put uh, this, uh, this sensor in, into the vagina of the cows in China. Go, go ahead, please. And you can see here, uh, uh, the red color here uh, shows the, the ambient temperature along, along the day. And uh, the blue color shows the fluctuations in the body temperature of the cows along the year. And the gray columns here represents the time of, uh, of cooling the cows, milking and cooling the cows, okay? In addition, we cool the cows also in the feeding land uh, in, in, in the barn. So we are trying to cover about uh, 10 to eight to 10 hours a day of cooling the cows in order to keep the body temperature uh, below 39 degrees Celsius. Next slide, please. And also we adopt, uh, we developed in Israel uh, very unique systems in Israel. You can see open roof uh, to improve the ventilation in the barn. It's very high roof and you can see the bedding area is large. Uh, you can see also big ventilators to improve the ventilators. Next slide, please. And you can see this is the, our milking cows lying on the bedding, dry, dry bedding, very, very, uh, ven very high ventilated uh, uh, barns. This is quite, quite unique to in Israel. You will not see such uh, big barns uh, abroad because we believe that if we, if we want that the cow will produce high milk production along the year, we must supply her the best uh, best conditions. And as, as a consequence, we develop this type of, uh, you know, free space uh, bedding area. We should be about 20 to 30, to 30 square meters per each cow. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, an, this is a similar, similar barn. This is actually a new type. There is no any concrete along, along the, the feeding lane. So and it, the area is cultivated uh, once, once a day or maybe twice a day. 
when the cows are out going to, to, uh, to be milked. So this uh, tractor enter in and cultivated the bedding area. Next. You can see the cows after milking on the same barn. Next slide, please. Who is involved in the dairy business? This, this is very important to understand how we brought Israel to be the highest in milk production per cow in the world. Next, please. Next slide. So we have, first, we have Israel Dairy Board owned and managed by those three boards by dairy farmers represented by the ICBA, Israel Cattle Breeders Association, dairy processing companies based on three major producers, Nuva, which is today is uh, purchased by, uh, by um, a Chinese company, Strauss and Tara, and the market represented by the government and delegates of uh, consumers. Next slide, please. So uh, the principal parts for breeding, management, health research, and advisory of the for farmers are those that are listing, listed here. ICBA responsible for DHI, herd book, genet genetics, herd management software, NOAA, which, the, you know, which uh, this is the, the best uh, herd management software in the world. And many, many countries trying to, uh, to adopt this system uh, without uh, successful because uh, this management system is based on uh, reliable uh, information uh, running back and, back and forth from the farms to the to the main computer and and uh, and from the main computer to the to the farms. Sion is artificial insemination organization. In the past, there were five artificial insemination organizations. Today, we have only one. Achaklayit is a veterinary service. Veterinary service. All these three organizations are owned by the farmers. And this is unique to Israel. We have advisory service uh, under the Agriculture and Rural Development, Development Ministry, which actually is the, the med, immediate uh, chain between uh, those three organizations and the research uh, leading by Voltani Research Institute, Agriculture under Agriculture and Rural Development Ministry, and Agriculture Faculty, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, which there I'm giving my lectures. Next slide, please. So uh, before we go further, we, you have to understand that uh, the, uh, the linkage between research advisory and those three organizations uh, health health veterinary service uh, icba and Sion, are unique unique to israel and because they are all the relations are connected together and we are trying to uh, uh how i say to uh, uh you know to enrich each other uh, uh, and by this way, we are reaching the knowledge of the farmers. Mm. Now, in Israel, there are two, two uh, main um, um, intelligence, I could call it, uh, companies. One is Afimilk and the other one is SCR, which are uh, marketing uh, globally in the world. And uh, they are succeeded to manage, uh, you know, scientifically fashion uh, the farms. We have to understand that during the years, the number of animals increasing uh, per farm and the attention per, per cow uh, is decreasing. So in order to compensate for it, we have to use uh, new technologies and this is under responsibilities of those uh, two uh, main uh, companies, Afimil and SCR. We don't have much time to talk about, but uh, they are very, very uh, well, uh, global, well known all, all over the world. Please uh, continue. Ne next slide. Next slide, please. So, if we to some to some uh, the historical events in Israel, 1930, starting the crossing local breeds with Olsten and Frisian bulls, from early 
in, in, uh, 30, uh, 1930s cooperation between farmers establishing the ICBA Ema Chaklait, owned by the farmers, and later Sion. 1950, modify, modifying, modifying barns for the cows, moving to mechanical milking. 1965, artificial insemination. 1980, developing the cooling systems for the cows, which, uh, and, uh, which was spread all over the world. And also adopting the total mixing rations developing intelligence system by two Israeli companies which are globally dominant today. And through the last 80 years, of course, this is genetic improvement all the time, genetic improvement. Next slide, please. So we have here the, the chains that together bring us to succeed uh, in producing high yielding cow, genetic housing, cooling system, high technologies, feeding management, milk quality, and other health. And the, the secret, again, is cooperation between all the organizations together. And this is very unique to Israel. And Melvin, this is answer to your question. How can we explain that the Israeli cow, uh, despite the fact that uh, we have suffering from uh, heat stress in Israel, uh, the highest in milk production all over the world. Because to, to have a cow uh, with high yielding cow, she must be in good health. She must have good managed, uh, feeding managed, genetic, housing, uh, cooling system, and so on. Next slide, please. So this is the end of my lecture. Thank you and wishing you success with all your willings. Yeah, well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Astra. You know, actually, this lecture could be like uh, a few hours, but he basically bring it uh, as a condensation to us for 25 minutes, just to give yes. us a big scope. Now, uh, Dr. Ezra, there's a few questions that uh, the panelists uh, or the uh, people want to ask of you. Okay, one is, um, it is not clear to me why the yields increase. Was it due to better living conditions for the cow or due to improved feed or due to genetic to, modification? Which one? Was it three of them? I, I cannot, you cannot uh, uh, differentiate between uh, each of them. I think this is a combination of all together. For, I, I will, I will uh, give you an example. In, Sorry, 1980, I, I... in 1980, uh, we uh, changed the, the, the feeding system to uh, mixing rations to the cows. You know, mixing means the, we mix all the com components together so the cows cannot differentiate between the particles of, uh, of the feedstuff. And she must eat all. And by, by these changes, we increase the milk production it is at, by 10 to 30% in one year. Okay, so this is the feeding. This is the feeding, uh, uh, health of the cows. You know, we have uh, the, the vet service in Israel, which owned by the farmers and the, the vet, the uh, veterinar, uh, the DBM vet is entering the farm twice a, twice a week in the farm, looking on, on the cows and in, in emergency, he's arriving uh, in the farm immediately. So, and we can, and the, the vet controlling all the cases of meta, meta, metabolic diseases, uh, you know, entry to uh, calving, entry to dry off, and so on and so on and so on. Everything is controlled by the vet. Uh, it's like, like insurance, okay? We don't, the farmer is not paying per a visit of the, of the farm, of the, of the vet, sorry. So it's a kind of insurance. And the, the, the same is with artificial insemination, inseminations. The, the farmer calls, the, calls the, the, the inseminator, please come tomorrow, five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, I will prepare for you seven cows for insemination, to check and to inseminate without a special payment. Again, it's a kind of insurance. So this is a typical or unique to Israel, uh, okay? 
So the farmer is actually enveloped by a very, very um, high level of uh, professionals. Okay? Now, uh, and again, the, the fact that we collect all the information from every cow, every day, and uh, accumulate it and transfer it, it from the farm to the herd book every day, every day. Mm. So we have huge of information in this uh, herd book that you can analyze it for developing, uh, you know, developing uh, next, you know, next visions you yeah. might have. Yeah. I'm, 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 going, I'm making now a research and I'm utilizing the, the herd book, you know, taking, taking information from this herd book. It, it is not occurring in other countries, only in Israel. And uh, lastly, I think the heat stress, stress relief uh, we, uh, we um, managed since 1980 is, uh, uh, was also very, very important. Uh, you know, and to, today we also, de when I worked in the in uh, visory service and agriculture ministry, we de developed a, a procedure to show who among the farms is efficient to relieve the heat stress by making a comparison between the uh, few parameters between summer and winter, and it is uh, it is shown to all farms. We don't we don't hide information. So everything wow. is uh, transparent to all. So, and, and, you know, and together we were trying to help all farmers to leave their, their value up all the time. Yeah. This is the, the of Israel. Yeah, that's great. I, I, I think what you are sharing is that the secret of uh, Israel's uh, high yields is actually a combination of the work between the government, all right, between the the private sector, and also the R&D, the research that goes in to help them. I think that's fantastic. I mean, that's one of the things I think we can take away from, uh, uh, you know, how we can develop this kind of uh, yields and innovation in our region. Now, there's another question I want to ask you. Now, is Israel an exporter of milk or actually you are actually producing milk for self-sufficiency? Because looking at the size of Israel, you are like maybe 9 million people. You actually, land-wise, it's about the size of, I think, Malaysia, all right? just as a comparison, land-wise. And then you minus the desert, you are even smaller. And uh, so the whole idea is, uh, is it for like food security, that means within Israel, or are you actually exporting your milk? No, uh, only a very small proportion uh, is uh, exported uh, because of uh, kosher regulations to, to uh, re religious uh, Jew Jewish in the world, Jews in the world, especially in the United States, but this is marginal. The, the most of the milk produced in Israel is for self-consumption. I see. So it's basically is uh, self-sufficiency, food security kind of idea. Okay. Uh, one question. From the businessman's point of view, okay, if you are doing uh, like, you know, the cooperatives and the family farms and so on, uh, what are the risks involved that we are, we should be worried about, like market prices, uh, the health of the cow, feed inputs, etc. Okay, um, the price of the milk is uh, determined by uh, um, Israel Dairy Board. Okay, and uh, if if you if the if if uh, you produce high quality of the milk you might uh, receive extra money for, for higher quality of milk. If your uh, protein and fat content is higher than the threshold, you receive extra money for it. In addition, as I showed you before, during the summer, the milk tends to, to decrease because of the heat stress. Now, during the summertime, 
the milk cons consumption is uh, op op positively increased because of the uh, consumption of ice cream. So uh, the uh, milk marketing board suggests uh, suggest fa uh, farmers in Israel, if you move the milk production from winter to summer, you receive also extra money for uh, transferring the milk from winter to, to summer. And many are doing it today, okay? By controlling the um, uh, uh, pregnancy of the cows and calving of the cows close to the to summer, okay? So okay. in this, in, this is the, the, the way things go running in Israel, you know? Right, see. Under, under control, all the time under control, uh, due to the fact we are uh, limiting in milk production. So we want to earn the maximum money from the, the, from the milk production. Thank you, thank you. There are actually a few other questions, but we are running out of time. Just one last question, okay? Now, uh, do you see uh, increased competition between dairy milk and plant-based milk, uh, especially as we move toward 2030? What are your thoughts about that? Again, I didn't understand the question. You know, uh, there are increased competition because there is this plant-based milk that are coming up and the dairy milk that are from cows, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it will be like more a mixture. So what are your thoughts about that? Uh, to make it short, I'm not worried about the competition. <laughs> Why is that? Why? Because uh, people knowledge uh, is increasing and the understanding that uh, it's very important to consume milk coming from the cows or coming from the goats or the sheep not from other sources, yeah. like soy, soybean on others. And you know, there are also risks of drinking. This is, this is uh, my view. Okay. Uh, there is risk of uh, consuming more uh, soya bean milk compared with the milk. Uh. Because soya bean, soya bean con contains a uh, kind of uh, like uh, um, hormones like estrogen. And uh, I'm, I don't think it, it is uh, good for all population. And in, in a matter of fact, the consumption of milk is not reduced. Despite the, despite the competition with other products. Okay. Yeah. And so, so what you mean is that the consumption rate actually keeps on getting bigger and bigger, bigger market, all right? Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Actually, actually I, I don't know about the rest, but I certainly learned a lot. But I think there are a lot of questions. But, uh, you know, what we do is that we'll leave you the contact of uh, Dr. Ezra and then, of course, of uh, Professor Matthew as well, so that uh, to follow through, you might want to go direct to them. Because that's one of the roles of uh, TBN. So I want to take this time just to give us an idea of what TBN is all about before we go into uh, uh, introducing Professor Matthew, all right? Now, TBN, actually, our goal is fighting poverty through enterprise. And we concentrate on Southeast Asia. And uh, we collaborate with a lot of stakeholders in our ecosystem, like impact funds, like uh, family offices, foundation, social enterprises, uh, including the public sector as well, in Southeast Asia to work together. And our core values are collaboration, empowerment, dignity, hope, and restoration. TBN has five pillars that uh, we work around that represents our uh, ecosystem. One is that we have a social enterprise training hub that we are actually currently running. We actually have already have uh, finished the first cohort. Right now, we are preparing for the second cohort. We are training social enterprise that are revenue generating to be investment ready. 
So that's where we are. We are not working with the startups. Okay, neither are we an accelerator, so we're different. But uh, because of that, we have also developed another pillar called Expertise Network. These are uh, industry mentors. These are specialists like IT and marketing and HR. And then we have uh, life coaches as well that goes to help them. Then the third pillar, of conferences and events. So this is one of them. Okay, a, a, a series of webinars that we will run that will feature uh, innovation, especially in uh, doing things that are good. Then we are connected with uh, another pillar that is called Investors Club. These are investors that want to look at uh, pipelines. Who are the social enterprises that they can uh, work with? That's why the Social Enterprise Training Hub and the Investors Club work very closely together. And the fifth and final pillar is what we call the Resilience Program. We developed that actually uh, during the COVID-19 uh, conference that we have uh, recently in May, where we get involved with three parts of it. One is matchmaking, people who want to help social enterprises or invest in them. The next is grant uh, funding. Okay, we provide grant funding to help social enterprises that are struggling during COVID-19. And of course, the third one is soft loans, uh, below market interest rate loans given to social enterprises, especially those that go through our social enterprise training hub to help them with uh, being able to sustain so that they will be able to thrive. So that's where we are, okay? So that's uh, TBN. And then the host and the sponsor of this whole program is Explorer. Explorer's uh, interest is really about impact travel. So it is a partner of uh, TBN Asia. We bring people to first Israel with regard to uh, what we call both the Bible land or the Holy Land trips, as well as Israel as a startup nation. So that's why it's so interesting that uh, we managed and the privilege to get uh, Dr. Ezra to join us. The learning journeys deal with bringing, for example, universities and, uh, and uh, some of the companies into Southeast Asia to deal with livelihood uh, and solutions. And then the team journeys as well would be things like social enterprises that, that helps reach out to the poor. So the picture that you can see here is really uh, one whereby we work with uh, uh, social enterprises that produces agriculture, fruit and vegetables uh, for the poor. So, Generally, it's in the same space. So, so we are involved with that. Now, without taking too much time, uh, right now, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Matthew Tan. Let me give you a brief uh, description of him. Well, he, Matthew is a very good friend of mine. We serve in the same uh, NGO that helps ex-offenders reintegrate back into life. Now, he is the... Um, Singapore's representative to APEC on the private sector with regard to uh, agriculture, okay, food security. And then he is a co chair as well in the panel in APEC that deals with uh, sustainability, uh, aqu uh, aquaculture, and uh, food security as well. Then at the same time, he's actually CEO of a company that is called Ascentoff. Uh, Aqua Asia, triple A, I call it, okay? And uh, this, this company is a Danish company, is a market leader in terms of what we call recirculation uh, aqua uh, culture industry. In other words, they do things that are clean, green, and ethical. And their uh, yields are, are, are very, very high, okay? One of the highest yields per hectare of land. So, um, and he also is a uh, associate professor of James Cook University of Australia, concentrating on uh, food science. Okay, without further ado, I hand this time over to uh, Professor Matthew Tan. Over to you, Matthew. Ah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Melvin Mark and uh, TBN for inviting me today for this talk. Uh, can I have my slides? 
Okay. Yes. Ah, uh, thank you. So I've I've titled my uh, my presentation today. You know, it's actually in the light of Aquaculture 4.0. Uh, this is a, 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 a article and interview that I gave to uh, United Nation under the uh, Food Agriculture Organization, you know, on what will entail in the next, in the next frontier in aquaculture. So specifically today, I will talk about uh, aquaculture. What will be the next frontier? What are the challenges, you know, that has been faced uh, by the people? Next. Uh, very quickly, let's just talk about uh, APEC. Yeah? Pastor Melvin has, uh, Melvin has you know, in, described my role. I'm currently Singapore representative to, to APEC and from the private sector, and I'm also the co-chair for sustainable development in agriculture and uh, fishery sector. Uh, just a very short introduction about uh, APEC. Now, uh, food security has become a very increasing concern for the 21 economies government that's represented uh, in APEC. Uh, we all know by 2050, world population will reach an estimated 9.6 to 9.7. Currently, we are at about 7.7. Uh, .7. Now, what is interesting was in the, uh, in the last APEC ministerial meeting, which took place in Chile in uh, August last year, and I was there, there was a presentation that uh, was presented, uh, a three-year study that was uh, done by Chinese Taipei on food waste and loss. Now, in that study, they showed uh, uh, that by 2050, okay, once we reach 9.6 billion, they did an empirical calculation. We need to produce 70% more food and we need 40% more land in order to support uh, that kind of production. Now, there's no, there's no way we're going to get you know, uh, uh, another 70% more food with what we are doing. Let's go to the next slide. Now, if you look at the, 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 the trend today, you may ask, you know, hey, what is this? You know, why, why is it that the consumption pattern, you know, has, has, has gone up by so much? Huh? Uh, it should be a very gentle curve, but in, in fact, the curve has actually shot up right to the sky. Yeah? And because of two reasons. One, the, uh, what we call the income growth, and the urbanization. In fact, the very group that is responsible for this spike in the, in the consumption of food is what we call the middle income bracket uh, population. Next. Now, if you look at this slide, this slide will show you our current you know, production in, uh, in fishery. What are the wild capture fishery? What are the, uh, the numbers you know, that are being currently produced by aquaculture uh, on land? Now you have seen, you know, that curve, you know, that's on the upward trend and the turquoise color curve. It is going far beyond what we are producing and what we are able to capture in the market. Okay, next. Now let me give you an overview of the uh, aquaculture uh, industry. Okay, now for those of you who are new to aquaculture, aquaculture is just simply the use of technology to farm fish on land instead of you know catching them from the wild we farm fish on land we put the cages in the uh, in the open sea so for the last 20 25 years aquaculture you know has enjoyed a very very good harvest people are using the the, the use of technology has propelled this this industry and you know one particular industry that has done really well is the stream industry and and among the many reasons why the stream industry has done so well is because of a rapid development in what we are known as stream genetics and nutrition. Next. Now, if you look at uh, this slide, huh, it will show you the available feed. The use of technology and the understanding uh, uh, on what causes you know, human muscle to grow. You know, like we all know, you want your muscle to grow, you need to take protein. But in order to have the protein, you know, for it to work for you can grow a muscle, you need the essential amino acids like methionine to be part of the diet. And this is a known science in, 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 in human nutrition. And what the scientists have done is that they have taken this science into aquaculture by producing what I call feed, you know, that's functional, feed that has got, you know, an exact uh, composition of protein and essential amino acid now, that can drive and accelerate growth in aquaculture. Next. 
Now, if you look at this slide, this photo was just taken last year in the state of uh, Pahang. Now, if you look at the stream that I put on my hand, this is a monodon. It's a called a tiger prawn. Uh, it is about 30 gram. Okay, it's very, very huge. You know, it, it almost filled up the entire of my, uh, 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 of my palm. Now, 15 years ago, it takes nine months for this stream, the monodon stream, the black tiger stream, to reach 30 gram by this size. 15 years ago, it takes nine months. Today, because of stream genetics, because of advances in nutrition, this stream that's on my palm only takes about three and a half months to grow to its current size. The current research in the lab now, you know, in uh, some of my friends' lab, the stream are now able to grow one gram a day, which means to say in the next, maybe in the next uh, 12 months to 18 months, you have streams out in the market that can grow to this size, 30 gram, within one month. So I, I want to just quickly qualify. Now, when I say advances in stream genetic, I do not refer to genetic modification. Okay, selective genetic breeding is a science that has been established for many years. What they do is that they find the best genes, the genes that cause, causes the growth, the genes that causes you know, disease resistance. They find the best genes, you know, they put it together within the same family of, of, of tiger stream, and, and there you got you know, uh, what we call selective genetic breeding. Next. Now, however, this good fortune in aquaculture has seen a rapid decline in the past 15 years. Okay, the, uh, as a result of you know, uh, the advances, uh, the industry has met with two massive problems. One, there's a massive disease outbreak that has taken place in the aquaculture uh, industry, which has given rise, you know, you probably heard about it now, to the, to the you know, uncondition uncontrolled use of antibiotics and chemicals, you know, because of a massive disease outbreak. We are having massive algae bloom. I'll show you some slides, you know, what are the algae bloom that are taking place in, uh, in Norway, in Chile, and even in Singapore. Now, in, in summary, the environmental related issue has taken a big toll on the industry and has caused many, many casualties. Next. The farm stream casualty, you know, which has come about because of massive uh, disease outbreak. Now, the stream industry is a classic uh, example. I mentioned earlier on, you know, since the 1970s, the industry has been on a, a, a bull run until about 10, 20 years ago. We have disease such as white spot syndrome, early mortality syndrome, EHP, you know, and then recently they had this uh, white flicker, you know, syndrome, you know, and the industry began to suffer massive loss. It has been a nightmare. And really on the two front, you know, here we are, we're fighting the COVID pandemic. And I want you to know the fish farmer and the stream farmer, they are fighting their own disease outbreak and their own pandemic at the same time. Next. Now it is estimated that the stream industry, okay, every year they're losing $1 billion, you know, uh, as a result of disease. Okay, now recently we had, in the last three years, we have an outbreak of EMS, early mortality syndrome one of Asia's largest stream producer, okay, they, their culture production fell by 47%. Next. Take a look at all this newspaper clipping and press report that I've been uh, following up with. Next. Stream disease that has, you know, decimated almost the, uh, the China uh, production. And especially even in Vietnam. So Vietnam used to be one of the world leading production of stream. Today, their production has dropped by as much as 50%. Next. Thailand. Thailand and Vietnam, these are the two world largest exporters of stream. Today, their market share from 40% is dropped to just only 10%. In fact, the, uh, the, the world largest stream producer, which is a, a very big Thai uh, Thai group, uh, they have given up all their ponds today. They, they have given up the ponds, you know, but they, they, they lease it to the farmers, you know, at a very low rate. And they said, look, you know, after you produce, we'll sell you the, the, the prawn babies. But when the, if you can grow the prawn, you sell it back to us, we will buy back. So there is a pandemic going on in, in the stream industry. Next. 
Let's talk about the fish. Yeah. Now the farm fish industry uh, uh, is is not having a good time uh, too. Now the floating cage culture. When I talk about floating cage, about salmon, we talk about pelagic fish. Is one of the most well developed and existed uh, for a long time. Okay, Singapore has about 112 floating farm, farm floating in the sea, and uh, total area that's currently occupied by floating cage farm in Southeast Asia is about 500,000 hectare of developed uh, fish farm, and they provide close to 400,000 metric ton of fish and crustaceous, valuing over half a billion. Next. If you look at this uh, next slide, this only took place in, uh, no, I'll go back again. This took place in March 2016 when a deadly algae bloom hit one of the world's second biggest salmon producer and nearly 23 million fish, you know, so wiped out because of algae bloom. Next. Then in August last year, another massive algae bloom took place in Norway and 25.5 million pounds of Atlantic salmon, you know, was wiped out. Next. Then we come to Singapore. This is in uh, 2009. We had an algae bloom. Three million of fish stock was totally wiped out. I remember this incident very well because it took place in December and January, just before Chinese New Year. As a result of this, almost 23 fish farms had to close down because they were waiting for the Hong Kong vessel to pick up all their groupers in time for Chinese New Year, but the, the algae boom came and they wiped out, you know, three million worth of fish stock. Next. Then we have 2014, another algae bloom. Next. 2015, another algae bloom. And this is in Singapore. Next. Then 2016. You know, just when they were trying to recover from 2010, one, two, one, three, one, four, from all the fish queue. And it seems, you know, the algae bloom is just not abating at all. Next. So my question is, so what is the next frontier in aquaculture for the next 15 years? Now, this is something that the APEC leaders that we have, you know, pondered at length, we have discussed at length. We are really concerned because aquaculture is a very important source of of, of fish protein. And for those of you who are in, in, in aquaculture, you know, I hope the next few slides you know, will give you an insight to perhaps what could be the next frontier in aquaculture, what we're known as aquaculture 4.0. Next. Now we believe that the next sunrise industry for the aquaculture industry, it has to be land-based aquaculture. Now in land-based aquaculture, you have a lot more control. Now, what you have seen earlier on, uh, the stream casualty, you know, the salmon casualty, the fish farm, fish farm casualty, you know, that's been plaguing our fish farm in, in Singapore. They had all had one common denominator. They were all exposed to external element known as the environment. The next frontier in aquaculture has to be land-based, you know, aquaculture with certain criteria. Next. One, okay, you must be climate smart. Okay, now what is climate smart farming? Now in my, in my previous company, uh, some of you may know, I was previously the CTO of uh, this company known as Oceanus. Oceanus is one of the world largest producer of uh, abalone. We produce abalone and uh, we need a temperature of between 18 to 22 degrees uh, to farm, our, to farm our, our shellfish. Okay, now normally in the month of April, May and June during a summer month, uh, the temperature eight years ago could hit a high of 25.5, 26. Okay, now at 25.5, a lot of the, uh, the fish that are temperate species will start to die. So you need to put in, you know, anti-thermal uh, technology, you know, to help you mitigate that. But you know, last year during summer, the temperature hit 30.5 completely unprecedented. It's never been so hot, you know, in, in, in the area that we've been doing the farming. So moving forward, okay, if you want to go into land-based aquaculture, you must invest in the technology that can allow you climate smart farming, meaning you can farm 365 days. Whether it's rain or shine or winter, you know, or harsh summer, you know, your system 
can continue to run. Number two, you need to have what we call as bio-secure farming. Technology that removes the environmental element. Now, I, I won't go into detail of what biosecurity is all about. You know, it's an, altogether another lecture uh, in it. Uh, but you need to have biosecure uh, farming put in place because then you do not, you eliminate you know, at least 90% or even 99% of the possibility of a disease outbreak of a disease spread uh, in your farm. Next. Now, land-based farm. Okay. Uh, sorry, let's go back to the next slide, a uh, previous slide. Now, in land-based farm, one of the biggest problems that has plagued land-based farm, uh, uh, I was running a land-based farm in, uh, in Pasir Ris. I used to run a, 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 a sea bass and a grouper hatchery in Pasir Ris uh, in 2008, 2009. For five years, I was running it. Now, we were using technology to try to breed fish and it was a very successful exercise. But I had a very big problem, okay? Now, as you know, in farming, feed is about 50 to 60% of the cost, okay? But my energy cost was about 25 to 30%. In land-based farming, energy is one of the biggest barrier. I was, I was using about 25 to 30 kilowatt to produce one kilo of fish. Now, at the kind of uh, energy efficiency, you will lose money, okay? So... For land-based farm, you need to look into energy efficiency where you spend less than 5 kilowatt to produce 1 kg of fish. Your, cost of, your energy cost must be less than 10% of your total overall cost. Now, last but not least, I call this the COVID effect. Small footprint urban super intensive RAS facility. Now, as you know, traditionally in a lot of countries in Southeast Asia, even in China where we come from, okay, uh, even in Singapore, all the farming community is usually based in one area. Like in Chinese Taipei, you know, all the farming area is based in one area called Pingtung. Okay, they're all there. All the farms are just, you know, uh, there. But do you know during this pandemic, it's caused a lot of losses to the farmers. I know of farms in China, they had a lot of baby fish and the baby fish are waiting to be fed. But because of the lockdown by the interstate, because of the pandemic lockdown, the feed company could not send the feed to the farm. As, as a result, many fish perish. We had farmers that had fish that is ready to be harvested. There was no workers. We have fish that's ready to be harvested, to be sent to the supermarket. You know, they end up dying in the, in, in the facility because there were no logistics truck they could come and pick up. So the COVID effect, uh, you know, is really, you know, it's really going to be the new normal for the aquaculture industry is we are moving to, so towards what we call a small footprint, super intensive RAS system where the footprint is so small and it can be located in an urban setting. Let's go to the next slide. You have skipped uh, one more slide before that. Yes. Now, let me just give you an, an, an idea. When I talk about small footprint, uh, super intensive urban uh, system. Now, currently in Singapore, if you apply for, if you apply for agricultural land, okay, if you apply for agricultural land, the government, you know, one of the requirements is in one hectare of land, or in one hectare of sea space, you must produce 17,000 kilo of fish. Now, if you do that, you know, you qualify and, you know, you can keep your license, you can continue uh, to produce. Now, under the new technology that's now currently available in the world, we're talking about one hectare, you produce one million kilogram of fish. I'm not talking about something that is uh, uh, space age technology. I'm not talking about something that is will be happening in the next three to five years. I'm talking about something that's really taken place in the last three to four years. So for those of you in aquaculture farming, you need to, to be aware what is happening out uh, in the world. Now, energy efficiency. I told you about, you know, my previous experience when I was running my farm. I was using about 25 to 30 kilowatt to produce one kilogram of fish. Today, the technology you know, which I'll show you a, a, a sample technology later on, people are using only 1.5 kilowatt and above to produce 
one kilo of fish. Stocking density. If you go to most farm today, land-based farm or even the sea, sea catch culture, people are putting in one cubic meter of water, they are farming about 25 to 30 ki, kg of fish. You can't push any more than that. Any more than that, the whole system will crash. The new technology that's available out there now is allowing you to farm 110 kilo of fish in 1,000 liter of water. Next. Uh, I was asked to just show one or two slides, you know, about the technology that, you know, uh, currently I'm, I'm, I'm working on. Now, Ascentoff is a, is, a, is, a, uh, is a Danish technology. This company has been around for the last 45 years. They have already gone through four runs, four generations of uh, technology. When I first visited this company uh, uh, six years ago, eight years ago, this technology was still not in place. Uh, last year when I visited them, I was very surprised when they showed me what they were producing. Okay, I'll show you a video in a moment after this. You'll get to see the actual facility. How, you know, they are using only 2,000 square meter, 0 0.2 hectare. They are now currently producing an average of three to 400 metric ton of rainbow trout. This is the system I'm talking, you know, uh, about. It only uses from 0 0.2 he uh, hectare to one hectare. It has a production capacity between 400 to 1,000 metric ton a year. Now the energy efficiency is only 1.5 kilowatt needed to produce one kilo of fish. Now more importantly, in, 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 you know, when, when the COVID took place uh, in Africa and in China, one of the biggest problems that some of my customer farmers, they were having, those are doing in the, the big pond system, they had no workers at all to harvest the fish for them. It is a common practice in the aquaculture industry where only during harvest, they bring in all the part-time workers to assist because they'll bring the net, they'll bring the net into the big pond and then they, you know, four or five people will, will push a net towards one corner and they gather the fish. This system that I'm talking about has an auto harvesting system. You don't need anyone to be there, uh, uh, you know, to, to harvest your fish, okay? Minimum manpower, I'll show you the, the manpower that this facility is, is, is using. Next. Take a look, this is a farm that, you know, I visited last year. Take a look at the video. If I can just quickly give a quick, you know, uh, just uh, go back to the previous slide first. So if I can just quickly give you a quick, you know, explanation. What you have seen earlier on is actually one of the facility that uh, my company has built. Uh, this is in, in Copenhagen. It is breeding rainbow trout. Now you notice now that farm uh, there 
it is only 0 0.2 hectare, 2,000 square meter. It's producing about 300 plus uh, to 400 metric ton of uh, trout every year. Now, first of all, you will notice uh, there's a moving gate uh, uh, in the system. This is a, a concept that's so well thought through after 45 years. Now, why moving gate? Now, as you know, when you, when you breed fish, you put in the baby fish, as they begin to grow, they need bigger space to grow, to, to grow on. The current practice is, you know, the, the farmer will, will bring a net in, hoist up all the fish, and then take them out and then transfer them to another, another tank. Do you know by doing that, the fish go through a stress period where they'll stop eating for between anything from four to six days because of the handling by the people. And usually it will result in a, a, a disease outbreak uh, as a result. So the system has many gates. It allows for monthly you know, stocking of baby fish. Okay, now one year it can produce 400 metric ton. Now the way the system is being done uh, is that it allows you to harvest fish every day, every other day or every other week. This is one of the biggest strength of the new, what I will believe the aquaculture, you know, 4.0 in terms of aquaculture because in current fish farm, go to any farm, whenever they harvest, they have to harvest at the entire pond. They cannot say they only harvest partially. Okay, and many times when you harvest an entire pond, it's just too much fish. So this system allows for partial harvest. You can actually, every, every day you can actually harvest, you know, one week can actually harvest a few hundred kilos based on the size and the requirement. Now, more, more importantly, you notice there was, there was a gate, yeah? There was moving upward, you know, as the gate began to close together. That is what I call the auto harvester. It actually brings the fish into one cage. It pushes up the water, to this cage, uh, caging system, and the fish actually goes up to a pipe, okay? And the truck is just actually waiting on the outside. So if you ask me, I think this is just so well thought through, you know, uh, 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 a system. And I think this is gonna change the way uh, farming is done. In fact, for the last two weeks, I've been meeting very strange people. You know, in my, in my aquaculture life, mostly I meet with farmers, I meet with university people. But for the last two weeks, I've been meeting with township planner, I've been meeting with people who are, who are in the REITs business. They say, you know, our next township planning, our next REITs, you know, we need to have a cell sustain, cell contained, and yet small footprint so that in the, in the event, if this pandemic were to continue for another two to three years, we want a system that's completely self-sustainable and it doesn't take up too much valuable space. Let's go to the next slide. Matthew, we have one more minute. Oh, one more minute. Oh, okay. I will just uh, quickly uh, rush through this. Uh, very quickly, so a cent off, they are actually, their key strength uh, is actually in a big salmon project. This is what we, uh, our strength is. We are actually a very big salmon builder uh, uh, in Europe. Next. Uh, some, you know, just to show you what we do, some of the projects we do. This is Marine Harvest. This is one of the world's largest aquaculture company. Next. Yeah. So the next frontier, if any of you, you know, who wants to go into this aquaculture, you need to use IoT, okay? Now you notice that the farm that I showed you earlier on, there was only one guy. That's right. The whole entire farm that you saw earlier on was just managed by one, one person, okay? All completely on AI, you know, IoT, use of, you know, uh, renewable energy. Uh, you need to look into selective genetic breeding. Now more importantly, the system that we are moving in, what in the center of is, is Zero use of antibiotics and no chemical approach to disease management. Next. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I think we can skip this. Yeah. So I want to just end this. Uh, for those of you who are aspiring farmers out there, this is a recent interview, you know, by APEC where I was being interviewed. Uh, and the APEC leaders and the APEC government have, we have acknowledging now that the use of technology is no longer a choice, but a necessity. Thank you. Next. Okay, I finished. <laughs> okay, thank you, Matthew. You know, there's, uh, I'm so sorry. There's so, so many good things. I mean, I myself, not, uh, I mean, not, I'm not a farmer, okay? I myself am so intrigued. But um, there are many questions. So for some of you, if I don't get your questions being asked and answered by uh, Professor Matthew, please, I give you his contact. Please contact him directly, okay? But one of the uh, questions that I want to ask is this. Uh, the heartbeat of TBN is about 
how do you use food tech for good? In other words, how uh, is it possible that we look at Southeast Asia and working with social enterprises help in job creation, help in economic empowerment, and yet at the same time bring up you know the the whole food security and sustainability. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that as like you know as centaur? What are your vision with regard to Asia? What are your plans with regard to Asia? Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Mark. I, I, I believe that aquaculture farming is, is just really going to change the way that it's been done. You know, I, I, while I'm talking to you, I'm looking at some of the questions that has been uh, flashed on the screen, you know, about does it equate to higher cost? Uh, now, in aquaculture, we don't look just directly at cost. We look into what is our cost per production. We also, you see, I came from, I came from a, a very a listed company, my background in the last eight years, you know, at the PTO. We always look into what is the incremental cost? What is the cost to produce per kilo of, of fish? Uh, I'm doing about four to five proposal now. And, and seemingly, we also came back to the same question, you know, Matthew, what is the cost? You know, would it be uh, too much? Huh? Now, I have to agree with you, the cost of the system is not cheap. Okay, a small system will easily set you back by, you know, uh, five to six million dollars, okay, Singapore dollars. But you, your return on investment is anything between three to four and a half years, because we've done the sums, we've done the math. You know, now a lot of farmers say, ah, you know, I don't have to spend. You know, I just use cages, I float in the sea. It's a lot much, much cheaper. But this farmer, they don't take into account whenever they have massive losses. You know, the wastages in in in, in the feed, and and now in terms of cost, uh, when you add up all this together our cost will be very, very competitive uh, with them. Now, to your question, Mr. Mark, as to how does a center look into, uh, you know, into Asia, you know, with regards to, to food security, with regards to, to, to the poor people, uh, we are working very aggressively now with uh, a number of big entities, okay? It's interesting that during this COVID, many of the big entities have come forward and says, look, we're looking to enter into the agriculture, we're looking to go into the aquaculture, uh, uh, industry. What we are doing is we are providing, you know, not just technology, we are providing also an education. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is important to know. Okay. Now, for example, like I, 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 I every, uh, before the COVID take place, every three months, I travel to Africa. Okay. Uh, for Africa to implement a technology like this, uh, they will require, first of all, stable energy. They will require, of course, the upfront, you know, uh, spending. Now, I know for a fact, that the the World Bank, uh, the government, those government investment uh, banks, they are now looking into this because they realize that food security is something that you cannot take for granted. If assuming December, if by December 2049, we don't solve the food security issues of having 70% more food, then by January 2050, uh, it will be a very disastrous world that, that uh, we'll be in. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think maybe because there are actually uh, some of the interested people who are here who are actually in aquaculture, okay, or interested in aquaculture in the region, okay. I know at least uh, one in Singapore, uh, one in Malaysia, one in Indonesia. Uh, I wonder maybe it's something that we can work toward uh, either some collaboration between uh, SNTOF and TBN Asia to you know, to look at what are some of the helps that can be given to the surrounding nations, okay? Uh, one other question is this. Um, you know, there's a question that's asked about, are there, because of this technology, are there matching grants? Now, I'm not sure about other countries, but uh, in Singapore, matching grants in terms of uh, government coming to support, help, because in Singapore, we also have this 30-30 uh, vision, right? To be 30% yes. sustainable in, by the year 2030. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, Professor? Uh, uh, yes. So, to answer your question, now, besides the 3030 Express grant, there is a grant known as uh, APF, uh, Agricul Agriculture Productivity Fund. Uh, if you are a farm owner, you, have, you own a farm license, uh, this will automatically you know, qualify you. They give you up to $2 million dollars. And they will give fund as long as you show you are automating your process, as long as you show that 
through this automation, through this implementation of this new technology, you're able to increase your productivity. In fact, uh, the recent 3030 Express grant, they specifically have one criteria. It says that in, if you want to get this grant, in one hectare, you must be able to produce 1,000 metric ton uh, of fish. So in Singapore, yes, there are uh, this grant. Now in some of the neighboring country, you know, if you are not considered first world, if you're not considered developing country, uh, there are funds, funding that I know uh, that uh, some of the uh, Pacific Island that I work with, uh, in Africa country, they have actually tech on, on World Bank funding. I see, I see. Wow. Okay, I, I think it's uh, uh, so important that what you're doing here is not just increasing yields and productivity, but you're doing it in a clean, green and ethical way. Uh, yeah. So, I think uh, you mentioned the word RAS. Basically, I think for, for the rest, maybe you can explain what RAS is. Uh, so that, you know, in different countries, uh, we are going through the same uh, clean, green, ethical thing. Okay. Uh, RAS stands for Recirculating Aquaculture System. Now, in short, uh, it's actually the life support system of a fish. Okay. Now, the problem with early, early day RAS system is that when they create the first RAS, the problem start to happen when you start to feed. The moment you start to feed, okay, two hours later when the fish begin to excrete, when the fit food begin to decompose, it produces uh, ammonia. Ammonia is in release. On the long run, because of uh, sludge and uh, uh, biofilm that is formed in the system, you begin to have uh, traces of hydrogen sulfide, which is actually very toxic uh, for the fish. Now, RAS system has evolved over the last 45 years. Today, uh, the, the, you know, the earlier system which I show you, it's an MBBR system. It's called a moving bait a bioreactor system. It makes use of uh, bacteria. It makes use of what we call aerobic biodigestion and anaerobic biodigestion to remove, to oxidize the ammonia from ammonia to nitrate to nitrate. Then it goes through a process of denitrification where the nitrate is being converted into nitrogen gas. So it's a very tedious uh, process. Uh, the main thing that wherever we do is that we always guarantee the biology of the water. Now, the biology of the water is key, okay? As long as you can maintain 97% saturation of dissolved oxygen at 6.5 to 7.5 ppm, okay? With a pH between 7.5 to 8.5, uh, you can start increasing your, the stocking density of, of your, uh, the fish. Now, your ability to keep that water in that pristine condition uh, will then allow you to increase your stocking density, which is key. So when I was running my farm, I could only push up to 28, 30 kilo of fish in one cubic meter of water. Anything more than that, the whole system crashed. The fish start to die. They start having lesion. You could tell, you know, their gills started to, to split. You know, you could tell that they are having uh, lesion issues as related to uh, levels of ammonia. Uh, technology has moved on very far now. Now, there's also a question I see, you know, say, you know, you're saving a lot of energy. Now, when I say 1.5 uh, kilowatt, okay, I'm talking about the core, the energy needed to run the system, which include running the system, running the, you know, uh, using uh, what we call uh, gravity to flow the water back into the system. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, there are a lot of other questions. Some technical one. But I, I just want to, at this point, uh, just add that I think uh, in my conversation with uh, Professor Matthew, he's willing to be like, for example, uh, especially on the webinar, it's very hard for him to be in different countries, but he can bring about, in a sense, a mentoring of uh, fish farmers uh, in the region to, to help, you know, kind of like increase their awareness of technology and productivity as well. So, uh, you know, I, I would take uh, Professor Matthew as one of our TBN mentors, you know, especially in the uh, aquaculture side of things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that will help because I think, uh, uh, especially in Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, there's a, a really a great demand for that. Now, there's one more question. Let me ask just one more question before I need to let you go because uh, I'm supposed to finish this by six o'clock. There's a question that is asked, what's the limit this machine 
In other words, uh, you know, the harvesting machine and, and so on can be redesigned to supply the whole of Singapore. Okay, so uh, that's a very, very good question. Okay, now let me give you some statistics. Now. Currently, we have what, about 112 farms. Okay, now overall, this 112 farm is producing about 5,000 uh, metric ton a year. Okay, uh, they are occupying, if I'm not wrong, about 112 hectare of sea or land space. Technically, if I am given uh, five hectares of land, I can, uh, I can double currently what is being produced okay, uh, in the whole of Singapore. And uh, I'm not just saying this just for the sake of saying, uh, I was very cautious, you know, uh, besides being an academic, I'm, I'm also, you know, uh, looking very seriously also into the cost efficiency, the cost uh, comparative advantage of the, 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 the technology. Uh, we only need five hectare to double what we are doing now. Okay, now to reach 30, 30. Okay, Singapore currently is consuming 50,000 of uh, uh, metric ton of fish, 50,000 of other, other seafood. Uh. Now, if you want to reach 30% of 50,000, that will be uh, 15,000 metric ton to produce. I need 15 hectare of land just to do that. Now, bearing in mind, these are all single story. I'm not talking about multiple story. The, the upper story could be used for processing. It could be used for, you know, uh, value add, you know, post-harvest processing. Yeah. So, yes, uh, if I can lay my hand on five hectare for a start, I will double, you know, uh, what is what all the 112 farm is currently producing in Singapore. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, uh, I, I, I really appreciate those. Now, I, I couldn't... Uh, answer every question or ask every question. Uh, my apologies because uh, time is running out. But I want to leave us with uh, the ability to connect first with Dr. Ezra with regard to the milk and then with Professor uh, Matthew with regard to the fish. All right. Now, before we go, can I ask of you to help us with a uh, feedback? For example, uh, I'm interested to be part of the TBN ecosystem. I would like to be invited for more of these events. Uh, what is the topic uh, that you like covered in future webinars? Because we are uh, continuing to run this webinar. Uh, but remember, our focus is not just about business business. Our focus is about social impact business. So to that end, we will deal with technology that helps scale. We deal with... Uh, sustainability and job creation that helps give livelihood to many people. So can you help us do that? All right. And then I think on our chat, we have the contact for Dr. Ezra and Professor Matthew. All right. In our chat. Okay. We are recording this session as well. And think for those who are, uh, who have signed up, I think we would make that uh, accessible to you. Uh, I will check that with my team, okay? So, um, on behalf of the, the whole group here, okay, let me see whether I can have... Uh, uh, okay, I don't have the poll results, never, never mind. You guys fill up the poll results. Um, uh, sorry, Melvin, you want the poll 2 results or poll 3 results? Poll 2 results are in WhatsApp. Okay. Let me see poll 2 results. By the way, you can also connect with uh, TBN, okay? In, in case you, you kind of like lost a contact and so on, please connect with us. Now, um, the important thing is, let me see, where are your results? Oh, okay. Those who are interested, um, the current biggest challenge for food and agricultural industry uh, for resource depletion and climate change is 80%. So that's a big challenge. Okay. For food nutrition and security is 47%. 
consumer demographic changes, 7%. Political issues dealing with government uh, and changes and so on and regulations, 20%. Availability and price of land for expansion, 20%. So these are some uh, key things. Stability, development, fluctuation in global markets, 27%. And so on. So I think the main thing really has to do with resource depletion and climate change. That's where we are heading. All right. So, okay. Um, please connect with us to TBN if you can't get to uh, both the experts. They are specialists. They are very, uh, it's really a privilege for us to be able to connect with both of them. So on behalf of TBN, Thank you for attending. And on behalf of TBN, a big thank you to uh, Dr. Ezra Soshani from Israel and Professor Matthew Tan from Singapore. So have a great weekend, every one of you. Blessings. Bye-bye. Okay, I'm going to close this session soon. So uh, hopefully everybody's already copied all the information that they require. Otherwise, type in the chat now for me to keep this open for a while longer. Okay, I'll be closing this session in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Thank you and bye.